Warm and friendly greetings uh, to you, dear honorable guest, uh, Dr. Fuad Abdel Khaliq, to this nine episode of the Voice of the Expert program. This program takes place in a particular and specific context marked by the appearance of a series of crises in our contemporary life, taking many forms, health, economic, social, political, environmental, etc. And of course, all the repercussions and effects that they induce at all levels. It's also a changing and evolving context characterized by rapid global transformations and uh, the emergence of new challenges such as knowledge explosion, technological development and digital revolution. All of this requires seeking central and primordial position for the expert in any field. The voice of the expert program aims to highlight characteristics, interests and contributions, main contributions of experts in various fields. It also aims to find out, out their expectations and prospective perceptions on different topics in their fields of expertise. Today is the ninth episode of this program in which I have the honor and the pleasure to welcome and interview our dear guest, Dr. Fuad Abdel Khaled. Thank you, Fuad, for accepting the invitation. Well, thank you for extending the invitation. It's just wonderful to be here with you this morning and thank you for doing this important work. Okay, so uh, I will start by quickly introducing our honorable guest, Dr. Fuad Abdel Khaled, who has a great CV. Fuad Abdel Khaled is uh, Armenia Distinguished uh, Professor and has served as Dean of the School of Education at the University of North. Carolina at Shapley since 2016. He is an elected fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science. He has been awarded several prizes like the Distinguished Contributions to Science Education through Research Award in 2022 by NARST and the Kuwait Prize for the year 2021. He has made transformative contributions to the scholarly study of the teaching, learning, and assessment of nature of science in pre-college grads and in teacher education settings. He has produced numerous publications on a variety of uh, topics, books, book chapters, reports, papers, etc. His copies profile is as follows. Index publications 66, citations, uh, citations uh, 6120, H index 31. Without delay, the first words for you, Dr. Fuad, before we begin to address access of the episode. I just again want to say thank you for having me today, and, and I look forward to this conversation. Okay, so uh, Dr. Fouad, the interview will be articulated around four axes. The first one, uh, professional experiences and consulting activities. Second, uh, research interests and achievements. Third, uh, nature of career. And uh, finally, future uh, perspectives. So uh, now we begin by the first axis, professional experience and consulting activities. The first question, you are an alumni, a distinguished uh, professor of science education at School of Education, University of North Carolina at Chapel. So what task do you take on in this position? Well, um, being dean of the School of Education, as I'm sure you know, is a full time job. <laughs> So essentially, um, my time is spent um, administering the school. 
uh, and the dean oversees all aspects of uh, the school here in the School of Education, uh, starting from the um, recruitment, um, hiring, uh, support, professional growth of our faculty, uh, to student recruitment, to academic programming, uh, to development or you know securing philanthropic funding to supporting the research enterprise across the school. And so primarily my position is an administrative position. Um, I've been lucky though, I've been able to continue to do um, scholarship uh, alongside this position, usually comes out from my own height, my own time. Um, so the first um, four years of my tenure as dean, I've been dean now for uh, a little bit more than six years. I also was co-editor of the Journal of Research and Science Teaching, which is a flagship uh, international uh, research uh, journal in science education. And I had a number of collaborations um, with my students and colleagues. And so I did continue to produce uh, some research during this time, but my appointment is an administrative appointment and it is the leadership of every aspect of the academic mission of the School of Education here at UNC Chapel Hill. Okay, quiet. Uh, so now uh, the question two, you have held uh, several academic positions as a professor in different universities, like American University of Beirut, University of Illinois, University of North Carolina. What you consider your proper best practices? So what you practice and enjoy as good in teaching, assessing, supervising, and advising students, and finally doing research? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so one thing about universities in the United States, which you know could be said to be an invention of universities in the United States compared to uh, their origins in European universities, is that the core mission of what we call the tenure track faculty in the US is a combined mission. It's a mission of research, a mission of teaching, and a mission of public service. So when you're talking to um, faculty who are on the tenure track in the US, um, we are part of our mission is to do all three things. Now, of course, we do have specialized faculty, faculty who do way more research than other things, faculty who do way more teaching than other things. But in my line of work, um, I have paid close attention to research, uh, teaching, uh, and um, public engagement or public service. I know that we're going to talk about my research later, so I'll talk more, more about that later. But I do want to take some time to talk about uh, teaching. Uh, and some best practices in teaching. Um, and here in the US, teaching, when we say about teaching, it includes the preparation of delivery of courses, but it also includes advisement of students, right? And so um, over my career, um, I have taught a whole host of courses, um, including some undergraduate courses, master's level courses, and doctoral courses. Um, I've taught uh, future elementary teachers. I've taught um, future secondary teachers, as well as uh, future researchers in science education, people who want to pursue academia. And I think two things cut across to what I think of as uh, best practices is to rethink what is it that we do in teaching? Um, uh, Teaching is about enabling students to come in contact with um, expert knowledge, um, but not being focused on quote unquote transmitting that knowledge to them. Um, so in good teaching, best practice in teaching is to create an environment in which students come in contact with the basic concepts, ideas, principles uh, of the content that you want them to master and designing experiences where they get to work with you to co-construct these understandings, right? This whole notion of, um, and you still see it in some parts of the world, and even in the US, this whole notion that I have something in my head that I want to put inside your head uh, is so, um, so outdated, uh, short of sort of putting a cable in my head and plugging it into your head. This whole idea of getting the learner to develop their own understanding is mediated by the actions, by the thoughts, by the conversations, by the experiences you engage them in. So I think that has always motivated my um, teaching is to create those experiences um, that will 
depending on the kind of course, that will get the learner to be exposed, think about co-construct their understandings for the um, content. Uh, and of course, to my mind, um, what we know from education is there isn't a single way to teach, right? Um, you have, as an expert teacher, available to you a set of uh, pedagogical tools, a set of devices, um, and you always need to think about what is the student um, learning outcome and then design an experience. Sometimes it could be a good lecture, sometimes it could be a conversation, sometimes it could be a project, sometimes it could be students working together. And so the other good practice for everyone is to have some mastery of these various pedagogical tools and to learn when and how to deploy these different tools to achieve different learning outcomes. So that's sort of a generalized statement on teaching, and I can talk more about it in details if you're interested. And the other part of it that we um, take as major part of our mission in education here is advisement. Uh, and the advisement ranges from working with an undergraduate student to think about the set of courses that they need to complete, all the way to working with master's and doctoral students. Um, and these are very different experiences, of course. Uh, near and dear to my heart is working with doctoral students, because here you are um, working with in amazing individuals. Actually, you learn more from them than they learn from you um, to work at the cutting edge of a field, right? Um, the students are coming in. They have a lot of experiences, a lot of backgrounds. Um, you and them are sitting down and, and pushing the, the, the boundaries of knowledge and understanding in these advanced level courses. You're helping them identify a research question that's worth pursuing and then guiding them with a committee to um, conduct some cutting edge research that will add to knowledge. So definitely these are um, really uh, important part of, of the teaching we do. And a huge part of what we do here in the US is, and other universities I'm sure, is what we call service or public engagement, right? And service could be service to your profession. Here you are reviewing articles for your peer refereed uh, journals in the field. Um, you could be um, serving on your professional communities or uh, organizations. Uh, you know, you could be um, rendering uh, service to some um, uh, to the state or or, or the nation. Um, and at the same time, uh, we have an obligation to provide public service you know, engaging in, with the public in whatever your area of expertise is. I, I hope that this covers some of the basic elements you were after in this question. Okay, thank you, Fuad. Uh, another uh, aspect in your experiences, uh, same question. You have mm -hmm. held uh, several administrative positions as dean, associate dean, head of department, same question. What do you consider your proper best practices uh, in right. managing human material and uh, financial resources. Right, right. Um, you know, I, I think the, um, the this is you know, the major goal of an administrator is to create the conditions that enable others in the organization to succeed. That's your major job. Your, your job is to uh, bring talent on board and then direct the policies, the procedures, the resources, uh, the governance in, in your organization to ensure that members of your organization are successful. That is really uh, the experiences. So as department head, as associate dean for research, and as dean, um, that is what guides uh, my um, leadership, because when you're in these positions, your quote unquote success um, is not personal success your success derives from the success of people in the organizations, right, that you are working with. So there's a whole collaborative um, part to try to bring organizations together, to bring a whole department or a whole school together and figure out at the core, what is the vision and mission for that unit? Um, take your time have conversations, have planning, have exercises so that members of your academic unit um, come to some kind of consensus um, on number one, you know, your mission and vision, but number two, what are some strategic directions for a certain period of time, and then come together and try to work towards these goals, while at the same time understanding that in academia, 
um, it's it's kind of you're doing two things, right? Um, on one hand, you have scholars who, for example, are teaching an academic program, right? They're preparing future teachers in my school. So they have to deliver an academic program for the greater good of the profession. At the same time, they're researchers, and each one of them have their own, have own area of expertise in which they want to excel, right? And so, um, to my mind, negotiating all the space uh, with um, some shared governance, shared understanding is best practices. Because as I'm sure you know, you're part of academia yourself. Um, academia is shared governance. It's people coming together around uh, these shared missions, visions, and goals. So that's to my sense, um, if I were to be in a position to talk to somebody who wants to take on leadership, I would say, number one, be ready not to celebrate your success because your success derives from the success of those you help work with and lead. Number two, work with your organization. Have a lot of deep conversation and bring them about on um, a common mission and vision and then create a set of goals and then use the other uh, resources available to you, your financial resources, your policies and procedures, um, your engaged communication to help drive their goals and the goals of the organization forward. So uh, the question four, you conducted several consultations with many national and international organizations in different fields and for a variety of subjects. What are the important subjects of uh, these consultations and what are your main, your main contributions, Dr. Fouad? Great question, thank you. So um, I've been engaged in a whole host of um, consultations. The, the nearest and dearest to my heart are those that I've done in the Arab world, particularly in um, Egypt and, and Yemen and Lebanon. Um, for example, in Egypt, um, I worked uh, with some non-for-profits here in the US, um, American Institutes for Research, Education Development Center, um, that secure large scale funding from the USAID, the United States Agency for International Development. Um, and in particular, there were two long term projects. One was called the um, New Schools Project and the other Education Reform Project. And my work with these projects was basically around teacher professional development um, to get practicing teachers in the field to uh, develop uh, more uh, sophisticated pedagogical skills, engaging students, uh, as well as uh, conducting large scale evaluation for the effectiveness of these projects. Um, one of the um, uh, uh, main contributions here, in addition to these professional development activities, was the development of a um, classroom uh, observation protocol in Egypt that shifted the paradigm uh, to get um, evaluations of teachers based on observing their classroom practice. Uh, and in that project, education reform project, we found that teacher practice over the course of about five years was significantly impacted towards more reform based teaching and uh, uh, practices as a result of the intervention. So these are some examples. It's a great way for somebody here in the US to keep connected with the Arab world and feel that you're um, doing uh, work that is relevant and meaningful to um, a part of the world that's uh, dear and near to your heart and where you come from. OK, OK. Uh, question uh, number uh, five. You have uh, served as uh, editor of the Journal of Research in Science Teaching and uh, associate editor of other journals. Please describe your experiences in these uh, positions. Yeah, thank you. Well, you probably know referee, journal or referee journals are uh, or play an incredible importance in any field um, because they are uh, the places where we engage in the social process of blind review so that we can uh, critically review and um, work to um, disseminate um, meaningful contributions, new contributions to research in the field. So uh, the Journal of Research and Science Teaching was my last um, sort of work with editing, and I was co-editor. This is the number one journal of research in the field of science education. It's been around for roughly 60 years, um, and it publishes uh, empirical research, conceptual research um, that is at the forefront of teaching and learning in science education across the spectrum 
P through 20, um, workforce development, formal and informal uh, science teaching and learning. And it was a very interesting experience. Um, we were two co-editors. We had 22 associate editors. We had 40 editorial board members and about 900 reviewers from around the world. And we had structured that um, leadership team to have a lot of uh, global presence. Uh, about one third of our um, associate editors and editorial board members came from countries across the globe because uh, GRST is a global journal. And we had um, uh, a huge load. We had about 600 submissions in any given year. And so it was uh, a very good experience to sit in, in this position and be able to coordinate such a huge process and engage in um, providing meaningful and critical feedback for researchers who submit their manuscripts and help them to disseminate the best research out there. Of course, a journal like the Journal of Research and Science Teaching is quite selective. Um, we had roughly a 9% acceptance rate. So unfortunately, we could not publish all um, the works that are sent to us, uh, but I believe we have been putting out there some of the best cutting edge research in the field of science education. OK, Dr. Poet, another question. You have had the position uh, as a member in the executive board of the National Association for Research in Science Teaching. Please uh, describe your experience in this position at uh, NARST. Right. So uh, NARS, um, its original name was the National Association for Research and Science Teaching. Now it's called a Global Organization for Advancing Science Teaching and Learning Through Research, is uh, one of the oldest and most prestigious um, professional associations for science teaching and learning in the world. It's closing in about 90 years now. Um, and the organization is the parent for the Journal of Research and Science Teaching. So that's a huge um, uh, tool for disseminating research, and we hold an annual research conference uh, that attracts attendees from around the globe, um, roughly one third or sometimes more than um, researchers who attend come to this conference from around the world, and it includes um, young doctoral students all the way to veteran researchers in the field where they come and share their resources. So I was um, elected to be on the executive board members many, many years ago. Um, and then also I served on the executive board um, as in my capacity as co-editor for Journal of Research and Science Teaching for about five years. And so the business of the board is always very, very uh, important. Uh, it deals with everything in the organization from its financial health to the organization of the national conference to the publication of the journal. Um, but it's really mostly focused on the growth of young scholars who are inducted into the field of science education. Um, we do uh, worry a lot about the implications of science teaching and learning research for policy. Uh, we do recognize uh, ex excellence in scholarship uh, through awards in the organization. So it, it was a wonderful uh, experience to be able to be on the leadership of that organization for a number of years. Okay, uh, for uh, the last question, you have won uh, numerous of honors, awards, and prizes. In particular, you are the laureate of uh, COIT Prize uh, in Economics and Social Sciences, the field of education offered by uh, the COIT Foundation for Advancement of Science. So the question, two questions, what does this uh, award mean to you and, to, and uh, what you express to CFAS? Yeah, that, that's that's a great question. You know, awards in academia, um, most of the time they're um, uh, just a, um, uh, a, a verbal honor, basically. It's a piece of paper most of the time. But what these awards embody are a recognition from your peers uh, about uh, excellence in your teaching, in your research, in your service, in your career. So it means a lot when your uh, peers in the field or a professional organization recognizes your work. Um, and so each and every one of those awards, whether they are in teaching or in research or whether it's a career kind of award, um, are clearly important and very, very special to me. We add to this the recent award from the Kuwait uh, Foundation for the Advancement of Science, the Kuwait Prize. And that, of course, holds um, a very special place in my heart for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, it, it, it was great to see that 
Kuwait had started the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Science back in 1976. Uh, it's an organization that is, I guess, fashioned after the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the British Association for the Advancement of Science, which are really old organizations. So there's a recognition there um, of the importance of science, scientific research, and most importantly, the celebration of excellence. Um, and I know that this award has been given since 1979. So it was just an amazingly present surprise to um, get this award. And it means a lot coming from an uh, Arab nation. And it means a lot that Kuwait um, has decided to celebrate the work of um, Arab scientists and expatriate Arab scientists, irrespective of where they are in the world. I think that is a really uh, important gesture uh, to keep people connected to their heritage. I'm a very proud Lebanese American, Arab American, and um, keeping that connection to the world is important. The Arab world is important. And more importantly is to have organizations in the Arab world who continue to celebrate science, scientific research, um, because that is so core to moving forward uh, on almost every front in our Arab world. Okay, now uh, we finish the first access. If you have uh, anything to, to add, on that Fine, position. I'm good. No, <laughs> completely. <laughs> yes, now we move to the, to the second axis, research uh, interests and achievements. Your uh, research interests include various areas, uh, like nature of uh, science in science education, inquiry teaching and learning, science teacher education, philosophical foundations of uh, science education, technologies for teaching and learning, and many, many uh, topics and subjects. We will uh, discuss each of these areas in depth to know the topics studied and the main contributions and achievements you have done. So my first uh, question concerns the area of nature of science in science education. What are uh, for the research questions studied and what are the main results that you found? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I do want to say while um, you've mentioned a number of areas under research, uh, for me, my research has one main thrust really, which is nature of science. Uh, and I'll talk about what that means. So the other areas um, that you mentioned, whether it's inquiry, science teaching and learning, science teacher education, philosophical foundations of, um, of science uh, education, they're all in this um, thrust of nature of science. And so let me start by saying what, what is nature of science? It's a, it's a um, phrase used in science education research. But if we think about science um, teaching and learning, there's usually um, uh, at least a couple of things that happen. There are, um, there's uh, scientific knowledge. So um, we teach students the products of science, right? So probably you have learned something about uh, evolution theory, or you learned something about chemical theory, right? Um, or um, gravitational law. So these are the products of science. And, and what we do in science teaching and learning is teach some of the products of science. Then there is an um, uh, processes of science. And so, um, you know, you have learned uh, or we've all learned in school about measurements or we learned about conducting an experiment or we learned about, um, you know, how to analyze data. Those are called the processes of science. And in so many ways, a lot of science teaching and learning stops right there stops at teaching the body of knowledge, stops at teaching the process of knowledge um, or generation in, in, in science. But there's a third area that is so important um, in uh, science education, and I'll explain why, which is this thing we call nature of science. And it focuses on um, what are the underlying assumptions that shape the processes of science and why should we um, have trust in claims to scientific knowledge and what are the characteristics of the scientific knowledge and that is an area in um, science teaching and learning that is usually underlooked it's not paid the attention it is due um, and uh, as a result we have um, so many ways suffered quite a bit as a result of that so let me give you some examples 
So um, when we graduate students from high school, um, they have a number of years of exposure to science. Uh, they exit into uh, the world. Some exit into the world of work from high school. Some go into college. Uh, many, many do not major in science, right? And so they take a couple of courses as part of their uh, college experience, and then they exit into society after a college degree. Um, so think about that audience, the general audience. Um, they are not going to learn, quote unquote, all the science they need to do. Right, scientific knowledge is so fast. They are not going to learn, um, you know, to be able to judge every aspect of science that's meaningful to their own lives or that are meaningful to society. So, as a result, a lot of our work in science education is focused on equipping um, future citizens with what we call scientific literacy, which is developing a functional way to consume science in the world and to be able to make informed decisions about science in the world, right? Um, so uh, this is why nature's, uh, nature of science is so important. Let me give you a very recent um, and painful example, which is the COVID-19 pandemic, right? We have seen across the world, including here in the US, um, resistance to uh, or controversy around some really basic, very well understood um, theory, which is germ theory and the transmission of viruses. Um, in the US, as in many other countries, we have literally lost tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lives because people um, in so many places, outright refused to do some really basic measures, really basic measures and very simple measures. Put on a mask and then when the vaccine is available, present your um, sort of <laughs> um, hand to a little prick. And in retrospect, if you think about it, think about how the world was behaving, what was going on, before we found the vaccines. Think about that. It seemed hopeless. It seemed people were dying left and right. The world has come to a complete halt. We did not know what we do to do. There was panic. Remember the first days uh, in Italy or remember the first days in New York where unfortunately people were losing their life left and right. And it was bleak. You know, if you think about it, it was a bleak situation. And of course, what saved the day? Science saved the day, right? Um, we came forward with this almost miraculous vaccine. Think about a vaccine that has a 95% effectiveness. Just think about it for a minute, right? Um, that is miraculous. And, and the research that had led to the development of the mRNA vaccines has been going on in the US since the 1990s. Um, these were, um, basic researches, basic uh, development going on in different places like uh, University of Pennsylvania and like uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison to just think even before there was a problem about different mechanisms to fight viruses. And so um, now we are in a different place in the world. Um, we have in many ways saved the day. <laughs> Unfortunately, before getting to that point, um, we were asking people um, to engage in a really simple measure, which is to wear to wear masks out in 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 the world, and after that to take a vaccine in their hand. So, when you think about what scientific literacy should have produced, we should have had citizenry who understand um, why it is okay to engage in these in these practices. Um, why would we trust just to take this strange thing and inject it in our arms. And you know, this is not the first time science saved the world. Think about every pandemic, if you think about the quality of our life now. Um, and so to me, partly, partly, this was because we don't have a populace that has developed these understandings. So when we say these vaccines have been developed through randomized controlled trials, Right. 
um, and that's why they are safe. We don't teach randomized control trials in schools. We don't teach even about the scientific review process in schools, right? Um, probably when you became uh, a professor, the first time in your life you sent a journal article somewhere and somebody sent you back, starts, sorry, Abdelali, we're going to reject your manuscript because here are the 25 different problems in it. That blind review process is a very well established practice in science to ensure that before knowledge is put out there, a group of experts look at it, dissect it, ask you for more clarification, ask you for better analyses, and then they make a judgment before it becomes part of the corpus of scientific knowledge. Um, we don't teach randomized controlled trials, which is the gold standard in medical research, before we start giving people drugs, <laughs> or before we start giving them injections, or before we start some kind of interventions. And that reflected into this deep mistrust that led, uh, unfortunately, to hundreds of thousands of needless deaths. And that's really painful if you think about it. Technically speaking, after the vaccines were developed in the US, hundreds of thousands of people should not have died if they just submitted to taking a free vaccine in their hand, right? Um, so that is the area of my research, which is what is it that we need to teach about science, not its content, not its process, but about it that will lead people to have higher levels of trust in science, while at the same time having a critical mind about it. This is not about creating faith, uh, you know, blind faith in science. This is about understanding why we should trust science. So that's the area of research that I work with. And that area of research is informed by history and philosophy of science. What does history of science, what does philosophy of science teach us about why these things are important and what do we teach to kids? So one thing to say here, I'm not advocating that we go and teach philosophy of science to kids in school or teach the whole history of science. What I ask is, what is it from these fields that we need to teach students uh, as they grow up in um, in the school uh, and then a little bit into higher education to develop the scientific literacy. For example, we want them to understand that, yes, scientific knowledge changes. However, you can still trust it. We want them to understand that science is a very creative process. It's not a place where you go and you follow this myth called the scientific method as a step of as a as a linear step of processes and suddenly you happen on scientific knowledge. We want them to understand that science is done by a community of people who interact. It has ins and outs and dead ends and trials and so on and so forth. So we want them to learn about um, these um, ideas, these assumptions, these practices that should increase their level of trust in science and should then um, get them to understand that these are some of the things that um, we look at when we deal with scientific knowledge. Um, for example, we teach uh, students or we want them to understand that there are some personal biases. There are theoretical biases in science. That is why no matter how careful one person is, we cannot depend on them to produce scientific knowledge. That's why when they have a claim, they give it to their expert peers who, who get to evaluate it before they admit it into the canon of scientific knowledge. So that's, that's the kind of research I engage with. And I've done a lot of this research, practically talking to um, participants from elementary school all the way to talking to Nobel laureates. I've um, talked to, assessed, did some measurement with elementary, secondary students, with science teachers, with college students, with scientists, with Nobel laureates, to try to understand how they think about nature of science. And so one of my contributions, along, of course, working with colleagues and um, a, a group of, of researchers, is how to assess what people understand about nature of science. This is, we uh, call it um, the views of nature of science questionnaire, which is one of the most uh, widely used assessments of nature of science around the globe. Then we did a more research, like what's the best way to teach about nature of science? And we developed something that we tested quite a bit called the explicit reflective approach, 
which is when you want to teach kids about nature of science, you can't assume that suddenly they're going to come to learn just because you engage in some inquiry or in some experiment, experiment that you really need to be purposeful about what is it that you want them to learn. And then you need to provide them with um, opportunities to reflect about what they learn. So, for example, uh, let's say you engage students in the control of variables, right? Um, and then they reach a conclusion. You cannot assume they understand why do we even control variables? Then you have to get them to think about it and think about how do we um, uh, avoid just thinking uh, inductively about science, that it's a little bit more, more uh, complex than that. So this approach is called the explicit reflective approach to science, to teaching about nature. Again, it's now a widely accepted paradigm for teaching about um, nature of science in schools and in teacher education. Um, so in that sense, when we think about what are some of the best ways to teach about nature of science, that's where inquiry comes in. Um, inquiry, uh, teaching and learning is a great context for us to teach about nature of science because students are experiencing some processes and if it's carefully thought about and if it's carefully uh, scaffolded, it can help them to understand um, how scientific knowledge is produced and why we should um, sort of trust it. So in that sense, I hope you when when you look at the axis of my research, um, you, you see how nature of science is a thread throughout the whole thing. Of course, I have done work with um, colleagues. I have done work with some of my students um, and of course we supported their own research, right? So it's not always about your own personal research. So you could see that I've done work in other areas of, as well. Sorry for the long answer, but I was trying to find a thread along these different different yes, okay, uh, questions you. that you had for you, me. Fuad, you studied, uh, you studied the, the, the nature of science in pre-college. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in the literature, uh, is the same interest exists for higher education? Interesting, that's a very good question. Um, so yes, and the answer is that it is as problematic as in pre-college education, because in the sciences, at college level, the main goal is still to produce the next generation of scientists. Right, and so when you bring people into chemistry and physics and biology and geology and you get them into these big courses at the beginning, you are still thinking they're going to become physicists, physicists and geologists and chemists. And so the instruction there is again focused on teaching the content of science and the accepted processes of science because you want that person to go in and do a BS in chemistry and then an MS in chemistry and then become a chemist. So we are um, finding that um, we are not exposing those students in the universities or not becoming scientists, right? Because you're not going to worry about scientists. They're bought into the whole enterprise. You're going to worry about the population. And you know, this has been a long, long pro um, um, problem recognized a long time ago. Um, and for example, um, Conant, who was president of Harvard in the 1930s and 40s, um, launched roughly in the 1950s, a number of courses at Harvard uh, called Public Understanding of Science. And this was an effort back then to sort of say, wait, we need to teach every some, everybody something about science so that they can develop functional literacy um, uh, about science. And so this has been a long standing uh, issue and a public understanding of science now is kind of understood, but very few places uh, provide courses in public understanding of science uh, as you know, Conant, um, who was president of Harvard back in the 50s intended to do. As a result, we in science education teach about nature of science in our own science methods classes when teachers come to us, which is a good effort, but it's not enough. I think we've been um, reaching out and working with scientists and there are some scientists who are on board. We've worked with them. They've worked in their own courses to teach better about nature of science um, and it, it does work. Uh, unfortunately, is not widespread as as of yet. The scientific enterprise in higher education uh, continues to be focused. You know, maybe they should uh, on the preparation of the next generation of scientists. While we really need to worry about that and the preparation of the next generation of citizens who are going to consume science, because it's all over the world. It's all around us, right? 
give you the example of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, but think about global climate change. Think about genetically manufactured foods. Uh, think about all these issues that we face, pollution uh, that we face day in, day out in our world. Yes, uh, well, it's well know that uh, the COVID-19 accelerates uh, the use and integration of uh, technologies. So concerning this uh, area of uh, technologies for teaching and learning, what are the research questions uh, studied by you and uh, what are the main results that you found? Right. I do want to say that I have not done um, hardcore, if you like, research in, in technologies, um, but I can talk to you about some of the interesting work that's being done in general here in, 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 in technologies. Um, there has been some focus uh, on things like virtual reality and augmented reality in the teaching of um, science um, uh, through some forms of research called embodied cognition. This is not something I've done, but that definitely is, is something that's happening. A big area of research also is um, artificial intelligence and how can we take um, a lot of data from students um, and process them through artificial intelligence al algorithms and feed them back into teaching. And I'm going to give you two practical examples. Again, this is not my own research. This is research that some of my colleagues and, and faculty in my school do. So here's an example of the use of this high end technology, which we call big data data analytics in the US and other parts of the world. Uh, take large science courses. Um, they use something called the learning management systems. Uh, for example, uh, Blackboard or Moodle, where students get their course materials and they submit homework and they interact via, via technology or a course website, for example. We have faculty in my school um, who capture all the students' interactions with their learning management system tens and tens of thousands of keystrokes and accessing um, assignments and downloading them and submitting them. And they um, capture literally tens of thousands of these little um, behaviors that are captured by technology. And they analyze them using um, theoretically based um, artificial intelligence uh, uh, algorithms. And they're now down to predicting the students who are at risk of failing the course within two to three weeks of beginning the course. And as a result of that, they use the AI to send students some scaffolds for learning. Uh, like, well, we've noticed that you have not accessed your um, homework materials in the last week. Do you think you want to do this? Or we've noticed that you're having problems in solving these uh, questions. Do you think you want to come to this uh, group problem solving um, form that we have? And those kind of researches um, have really impacted the success rate, especially of students who are at risk of failure. Another major example um, that we use, um, and this was research that was going on at the University of Illinois when I was there, is trying to capture students' interactions with multi-touch devices. So we have these um, big electronic tables. They're like your table. The difference is that they're a digital screen. And students solve mathematics problems on them, manipulating digital items. And so all of these student problem-solving attempts are captured by AI and then analyzed and presented to the teacher to sort of get a sense of what's happening in these different groups because I'm sure as a teacher, if you have a class of 20 working in groups of four, so you have five groups going on, at any given time, a million things is happening. <laughs> like how can you keep track of what's going on? So this was some interesting research that tries to capture students' interactions and providing the teacher a sense of what's going on at these different tables so that the teacher can go and redirect students or help them solve a problem or understand how to move forward. Um, so these are some of the examples. There's research now done on going into virtual reality and manipulating a, a chemistry molecule in 3D in virtual reality so that you understand how it works. So again, uh, my use of technology has always been more um, in sort of like um, collecting data and administration, but I don't do research on, on technology for teaching and learning. 
but I hope I provided you with some examples of some cutting edge use of technologies in here. Okay, well, uh, the last question uh, to explore topics of uh, science education, in particular for your domain, nature of uh, science, quantitative methods and techniques are used. So several uh, practical tools are in hand. So what kind of uh, quantitative tools did you use in your research? And the uh, second phase of this question, are these tools sufficient to solve the problems that exist? Right, that's a great question. So um, in, in my own research, I used uh, all kinds of tools. But in particular, uh, one way to think about it is that we use both qualitative and quantitative research. Um, and so in a really interesting way, in my own research on nature of science and our uh, research group's focus, we shifted away from using some quantitative measures towards more qualitative measures. And let me give you uh, an example. So in the 60s and 70s, up to the um, late 80s, when people wanted to understand what students knew about nature of science, they gave them a paper and pencil questionnaire. So they gave them multiple choice items. Um, now, these are you know, good assessments. The problem was, when, they, when the researchers were designing these um, items, they always had philosophy of science or history of science in their background or in their back um, uh, uh, of their minds. And so they designed these questions and the choices to reflect different philosophical traditions and difficult, different things we know about science. And so the students would come and no matter what the student chose, it came across as if they have these philosophical beliefs about how science works, which just didn't make sense because students do not get a chance to learn about nature of science in, in middle school or secondary school. So these instruments showed that students did not understand nature of science, but they also showed that they were committed to certain views, like you know they were positivists or they were um, you know empiricists, whatever that means. I don't think people <laughs> have a deep philosophical understanding of these. But when we started talking to students, we found that, well, their understanding is a little bit more fragmented. It's a little bit more fluid. It's depending on their exper experiences. So we actually moved away from uh, these quantitative measures more towards um, open-ended interviews. Like we sat down and would ask them questions like, what do you think science is? How do scientists go about doing their work? Um, what is the difference between a theory and a law? Um, uh, do you think um, scientists looking at the same set of data will come to the same set of conclusions? And then we found a whole new world of how students understood science. And of course, after a while, talking to a lot of students, we started having emergent patterns. And so we started using paper and pencil assessments, but instead of using quantitative assessments, we use open-ended assessments. So we would give an, a question and then um, we'll the students will write a long answer. And then instead of interviewing everybody, we picked a small random sample and in, you know, asked them, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? To ensure that we're not interpreting for them. We're asking them to help us interpret their, their um, responses. And then we would engage in qualitative um, data analysis to understand patterns. And then of course, in the next phase, when we go back into conducting a um, an experiment, whether it is randomized or non-randomized, we had to use quantitative measures to see if there were differences in students' outcomes on the interventions. So I have to say that um, in educational research writ large, we have a lot of um, research tools available to us. We have qualitative methods, quantitative methods. We have um, mixed methods, which is now a huge you know, uh, tool. We have statistical integration of big data. So we have people who don't go out like me and collect our own data by conducting interviews or putting out questionnaires, but they download huge educational data and they analyze it. So the method itself is less important than the choice of method. So when you have a question, right? Then you pick your method. So if somebody wants to understand, for example, some correlation, uh, is student uh, educational achievement uh, uh, correlated with their social economic background, for example? Um, 
then of course you're going to use some quantitative methods <clears throat> to try to get this data and try to find statistical correlations. And we're getting really sophisticated uh, in trying to understand this because when you ask a question like, is a student's um, educational attainment related to their um, uh, socioeconomic status, then you have students living in FAS who live in a very different environment than people living in your own town. And so we've developed even more sophisticated statistical techniques like hierarchical linear modeling that accounts for grouping. But if you're asking, asking a question about why, why are students with lower socioeconomic status let's say not attaining as their more well-to-do counterparts, when you need to understand those kind of questions, mechanisms, you have to use different techniques. You have to go down, you have to observe students, you have to talk to families, you have to try to find what is it that's underlying this, this gap, and then you can go and design more quantitative methods to test it. So I always tell um, my students and researchers, that um, the the um, the uh, uh, methods as understood as they are are not your primary driver your primary driver is the question you're trying to answer and then you deploy the methods that are best suited to answer your question thank you for that uh, very complete response about your research activity if you want to add more about your research uh, topics uh, or your uh, main contributions um, no, I think we covered quite a bit. I feel that we have made some major contributions to assessment of nature of science, to teaching and learning about nature of science, and even to conceptualizing nature of science uh, in, in K through 12 and also in uh, teacher education. And uh, there's always work to be done, as I'm sure you know, uh, moving forward. Now we move uh, to, to uh, the third axis, the nature of uh, experts' career. Uh, how was the academic and professional road, a road of flowers or a road with obstacles and difficulties? The first question, we know that the success factors are diverse and quite numerous. Some are intrinsic and others are extrinsic. So what are the most important success factors that help it to create your academic and professional path? I um, so, I, I don't know whether um, kind of positive or negative is how you frame this. Um, to me, my pre-college experience was quite formative. Um, we were kind of very lucky in Lebanon to have some amazing schools when I was growing up. And we had um, great uh, educational experience, but of course, uh, it was not the experiences that my children are having now. We did not have a lot of projects. We did not have a lot of hands-on experiences with science or, or research. We pretty much were, um, and maybe this is your experience as well, giving lessons that we kind of uh, memorized and came back and spit out, or we were trained to solve uh, algorithmic problems. Uh, but still, uh, by and large, it, it, it was um, uh, a, a good experience. Uh, and moving forward at every uh, juncture, whether it is in um, pre-college and college and graduate school, you're always going to face challenges, right? You're always going to fa uh, face uh, some dead ends. You're always going to face some difficulties. Um, and so uh, my, my general message is, um, a little bit of luck and a lot of hard work will always get you there. Um, but the most important thing to my mind, um, and I bet every person that you know has this experience, is who were the teachers? Who were the key people uh, in every step of the way that you could go to? Who helped you um, think about what's going on? Who provided you with some guidance? Who provided you with some mentorship? Who provided you with some coaching? And of course, this differs from one context to the other. So, um, you know, the, the, the main thrust is um, you're always going to um, face problems. You're always going to face challenges is how you deal with them. So let me just give you one example, because, you know, you could you could speak for hours on this. Um, when you um, conduct a piece of research and, um, you know, you write this uh, manuscript and you think, my God, this is the best piece of research anybody has ever done anywhere in the world. <laughs> and then you um, you submit it to a journal 
and uh, it comes back, uh, let us say, with a rejection, or it comes back with, uh, we think there's a little bit of good things in there, but here are the 101 changes that you have to make to convince us that it's a good piece of research. Um, I always felt, and I always tell my students, after this initial shock, you just need to take that and put it on the side because it feels like somebody has reached out to your throat and just strangled you, right? Because you've invested so much time and energy into this. And then after you calm down a little bit, you bring back all that feedback and sort of take the position of, well, wait, um, there might be good points in there for me to think about. Um, there might be things that I can change. Um, the feedback is critical, but it might be useful. And then you sort of take your time to dissect what is being said. Uh, you take issue with some and you think, well, I can defend this. They think this is the case. They misinterpreted what I, what I was trying to say. Maybe I should change the way I'm saying something. Or you'd say, well, they have a great point here. I just did not use the right unit of analysis for this. The message being is every time after you get over this initial shock, whether it's anger or disappointment, take your time to take feedback in and interact with it in a positive way. I will tell you every piece of paper that I published ended up being much better because of the feedback you get from peers. So take that idea and implement it to feedback you get from your teacher, implement it from feedback you get on your report, implement it on any kind of challenge you face, assuming that the other actors, whether your teachers or colleagues or peers are giving you feedback in good faith, right? <laughs> then you need to sort of Slow down a little bit, think about the feedback, act on it, engage in it positively, and you're going to be better for it, irrespective of what you're doing. Now, Fuad, uh, if uh, any negative in your career, are there any difficulties, problems, or obstacles that you have that have uh, negatively affected your academic and professional path? Yeah, uh, I would say um, going back, I've been quite lucky. Uh, you're going to always, as I said, have challenges, whether you are a graduate student, um, you know, whether you are a uh, faculty member, uh, whether you are um, an administrator, you're always going to find challenges. Like, for example, did every grant proposal I submitted what, get funded? Absolutely not. Actually, uh, in the world of academia, it's very, very hard to get funding for um, um, every project that you think you want to do, right? Especially if it's um, a national organization like the National Science Foundation, for example. Um, so trust that uh, you are going to um, uh, get the no, thank you. You're not going to be funded. Um, you have to persevere. And um, when you put a, um, a proposal there, for example, or a project that uh, gets good reviews and gets funded, that will be a reward for the dozen that were not funded. So again, I, I go back and sort of say, what is it um, that you're getting uh, challenged with? Um, what kind of feedback are you getting? Who can you seek for advice? I always um, tell uh, my students, uh, I have my own confidants that I reach out to and ask them about, well, I just got this piece of feedback. How can I work with it? I just hit this roadblock. Um, and I um, always try to find people who are experts somewhere um, and reach out to them and try to problem solve. So I think it's a way of how you position yourself against the challenge. Um, get over the initial disappointment. Um, look at it from a positive perspective. Um, get the resources, reaching out to the people you trust. Uh, do more hard work to try how to solve the problem. And you're going to succeed, but trust me, every juncture you're going to have some challenges facing you. And for it, uh, the final question to make a zoom toward the uh, toward yourself. Are there any personal filers or uh, mistakes in your academic or professional path? Wow, that's a great question. Um, my sense we um, I, I wouldn't uh, think about anything that is major, but um, here's my advice um, to uh, people in any career, but especially in academia. Um, always be uh, mindful of your relationships. Always ensure um, that you are kind to people, especially when you are in a position of power. That's really, really important. 
Um, sometimes when you're in a position of power, like an advisor of a younger student, or if you're the department head of a junior faculty, or if you're a dean of a department, um, you always need to think that your position of power um, gives you a lot of influence over people. What you say matters, what you do matters. Um, and I try to live by that day in and day out and always think about what my words and my actions um, uh, uh, would generate because I've been the recipient of not so kind <laughs> of input sometimes from colleagues and from other places. Uh, and so uh, I always try to live by that and resist this initial um, um, reaction sometimes around things that we think are not OK or not good. And so um, that's that's my uh, my advice there um, is uh, always be kind, uh, always listen, uh, always provide good feedback. And the more power you have, the kinder you need to be and the more um, positive you need to be and the more supportive you need to be. OK, Fouad, now uh, we start uh, the first axis perceptions and uh, projects, projections or towards the future. Uh, the first question, you have several contributions and achievements. Uh, what are the contributions that you consider the significant, the significant and the most important of your academic career in yeah. terms of teaching, research, consulting? Right. Um, let's take them uh, definitely in terms of my consultation. I feel that um, the work that we have done in Egypt uh, and Yemen were really important. Um, I think, for example, in the um, um, uh, project uh, that was focused on new um, new schools project, um, I was part of this huge endeavor that established um, or built schools in rural Egypt uh, and that got uh, more enrollment uh, from rural kids in these schools, ensuring their success. Um, I, I think that's great. Um, the education reform project and the fact I remember we worked with as many as 14 or 15,000 teachers over the course of five years um, and finding from our, our evaluation that teachers were doing um, better and more reform minded practices in, in the classroom was uh, a really uh, satisfying contribution. Uh, in Egypt also, we found that teachers wanted uh, their supervisors to come and observe them teaching and give them feedback as compared to just, you know, years of experience, for example. We thought that that's great to change the dynamic of teachers wanting to be um, judged on their practices inside the classroom. And of course, this is a subsample um, of uh, of, of some of the consultation work. Uh, in my teaching, I have put out um, there and mentored around a dozen doctoral students who are out there now. Um, many of them are in academia. Some are already um, uh, tenured associate professors who continue to do their own contributions. I have worked with hundreds and thousands of teachers uh, in the US and around the world through uh, being students in, in, in my departments or unit becoming future teachers or their practicing teachers that I got the pleasure of working with. And I hope that um, the way they're uh, teaching science for future generations is a little bit better as a result of that uh, contribution is, is really great. And in, in um, research, definitely the work we've done in trying to say what is it what is it that's important about nature of science to teach in schools uh, how do we assess how students and teachers think about uh, nature of science and what's the best way to teach it um, because this was not always um, uh, very well known uh, these are some of the major contributions that i'm going to put out there uh, and last but not least of course as you become an administrator uh, a department head and an associate dean and then a dean now i'm mostly proud of um, the uh, br bringing in talent, especially students, faculty and staff into my organizations, um, working with them to build a vision and a mission for the unit and supporting them and uh, providing them with the resources as we continue to work towards our goals. Um, I have had the pleasure of seeing young junior faculty um, excel, um, students who came to us and now are leaders somewhere, whether they are 
teachers or principals or school counselors or school psychologists or um, scholars in their own uh, field. So um, each and every one or each and every facet of this job is very, very satisfying. And it's always good to see um, people you work with just excel in these different areas. OK, if we had another question, uh, do you have any open question or problem that has not yet been uh, addressed in the field of science education or otherwise? Well, a hundred million. Uh, you know, when, when you run out of questions, you have to stop doing what you're doing. <laughs> so I, I can talk to you about some of the things that are um, right on my mind, some that have to do um, with my own research and some that are a little bit broader. So in my own research, um, the one thing that uh, is keeping me up at night, as they say, is um, how do we develop more trust in science among the general population? Uh, I really, really hope that now things are better with the COVID-19 pandemic, that we don't um, forget and forgive. <laughs> I think that was a... Um, an experience like no other. It was an experience that kind of was literally felt by every human being in every corner in this world. Maybe not to the same extent of intensity, maybe not to the same extent of strife, um, but it's just a global experience that showed us how fragile we are and that showed us how important it is to continue to think about, invest, and support in the best science. Um, so. I'm really thinking about how do we marry? How do we get to the point in this world of social media and what some people think of as the demise of the expert or the demise of, of, of um, canonical knowledge to help uh, everybody develop a healthy, healthy trust in science, a healthy trust in expertise, uh, a healthy trust in institutions so that the next time we face a crisis like this or of a different nature, but that lends itself to um, being solved by science and by expertise and by um, um, transparent institutions that we do not get into a place where um, hundreds of thousands of people end up losing their lives unnecessarily. So that is, um, quite related to my own research now is how do we move from nature of science to thinking about developing trust in science. On the broader perspective um, of what's really important for me now is how can we ensure that every student, every learner is given um, equitable opportunities to succeed, right? Um, one size fits all does not work when you walk into a classroom or a school or a community. The members of those community do not have the same opportunities. They do not have the same resources. They do not have the same supports to ensure they all are given real opportunities to succeed. Right. Um, what is it that we can do to differentiate our work with students, with families, with communities to ensure that everybody is provided an equitable opportunity to succeed. That's a big open question, right? Um, last but, but not least, how can we make uh, great use of uh, sophisticated technologies to break down barriers, right? Now we're having a conversation, you and I, because of this technology, right? Um, uh, but uh, just sitting here and talking to each other is very different from having a class online. We all were horrified by the kind of teaching and learning that happened over the pandemic. Um, you know how, and that's just one example of how we can harvest the power of some amazing technologies for great use, for best practices. Use. So, as I told you, there's always a million and one questions. Um, my faculty and my students always have amazing questions to ask. You have a lot, and I think um, it's a sad day when we run out of questions to ask and 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 do some scientific research around it. OK, Fouad, uh, in your opinion, what will be the basis of future uh, reforms for education systems at international level? Uh, and uh, can developing countries like Lebanon and uh, Morocco follow the expected directions of these future reforms? Yeah, that's a that's a huge question, but an important question. Um, the, the the important thing to realize is that if there's a will, there's a way, right? 
Um, and I think that um, any community, any society, if it comes together around a clear vision, they can make some headway. The other thing that I do want to say is that um, there shouldn't be some uh, one standard that everybody uh, needs to aspire to, right? Uh, we need to start where we are uh, in the context of who we are, what our culture is, what our goals are, how can we come together to move forward? As I'm sure you know, um, if you take some international assessments um, uh, like uh, pizza, for example, um, we know that we could do better in several parts of the world, including the Arab world. Um, we know that we have to move forward. We know that we have to catch up with a whole host of areas. Take, for example, again, I don't want to make uh, this only about science, but take science. Um, we have a long way to go in terms of being um, uh, of producing scientific knowledge in that world, right? Um, we produce, but not at the level um, that we should be doing. Um, when we think about preparing students for a future um, uh, of work in which um, critical thinking, problem solving, collaborative work, uh, smart use of technology, smart use of knowledge, um, when we think about this dimension, are we doing what's enough to prepare our citizens uh, for the future? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of axes that we can go down in terms of thinking about reforms. But to me, the most important thing is that a community, a nation or a set of nations need to rally together, um, get their heads clear, uh, agree on how to move forward uh, and then put the resources needed uh, to, to move us to the next stage. So. Um, in summary, I think we need to start thinking what does it take not to survive, but to thrive in the 21st century? Um, what are the learning uh, outcomes, whether it is pre-college education or college education in our in the context of our nations? And how can we move our students uh, and our learners and our future citizens to, towards towards the benchmarks we need them to be at by the time they conclude their their education, whatever level it is? OK, uh, and uh, for STEM, what will be the future of teaching and learning of STEM, science, technology, engineering and mathematics? Well, that's that's a great question. Um, my sense is that we are going to become um, a little bit more fluid in defining where one discipline starts and where the other one begins. Um, the idea of just teaching mathematics in the abstract uh, while has some significance and it needs to be done, it's better taught within the context of other things that are meaningful to kids. Um, the notion of, uh, you know, my biology class will be independent from my environmental science class doesn't make sense. Uh, now we're talking about bringing engineering and technology into the fold. And so uh, my sense is that we're going to start thinking more about blurring uh, the, the, these um, silos of the past and creating holistic experiences for students um, in the schools. They still need to learn some basic principles, ideas, practices, but we can think, for example, about design becoming a place where students, even in middle school or elementary school or high school, can be um, provided with a locally meaningful project. Let's design uh, a way to or a project or something to solve a local problem like um, recycling in our own school. Uh, you know, what are some of the things that we need from mathematics and from engineering and from um, environmental science and from chemistry to understand how to solve this problem? And of course, each one of these problems could be um, made at the level of the students, whether elementary, middle school or, or high school. This idea of bringing students together to solve problems that are meaningful to them in their context that can be used then as a medium to teach them the content will, I think, be the future of how we do this work. OK, for the, the last question, what are your ambitions and future plans? Wow. Um, um, my, of course, uh, as, as I told you from the get go, when you become uh, uh, in, in sort of leadership positions in education, uh, you start uh, thriving on the success of others. You start thriving on the success of your students and alums and faculty and staff. And so it's 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 a great hunger 
and um, what I what I look for is um, uh, leadership positions that allow me to even do more of that um, to get um, to work with um, academic institutions <clears throat> for more ambitious vision, more ambitious goals, mostly taking on the hardest problems that academia is set to solve, create the best communities of collaborative individuals working together, learning, researching towards moving us forward. And when you sort of got accustomed to that, you want more and more of it. So I think that is that is part of the future that I hope I could be um, uh, more and more engaged in this great thing that is higher education, uh, which to my mind is 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 one of the greatest uh, one of the greatest uh, human inventions to bring in people to and get them to focus on the world of ideas, on the world of um, critical thinking, on the world of learning and developing expertise to then come together and do interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary collaborations to solve the most difficult problems that face us. Okay, thank you, dear uh, Fouad. If you have any ending words before close the episode. I, I want to, first of all, just thank you for reaching out and for having this conversation. I want to say um, thank you for the program that says voice of the expert. Um, I think expertise matters and this global trend um, of somehow uh, starting to um, undermine expertise, and I'm talking about legitimate expertise, not just somebody claiming to be an expert, and um, expertise built within institutions. Thank you for putting together a show that um, re-emphasizes the importance of expertise and scientific knowledge, whatever the field is. I'm not just not talking about the hard sciences. So I really thank you so much for, for this conversation. Thank you, Fouad. We are now coming to the end of the episode nine of the Voice of the Expert program in which we have the, the honor of inviting our dear guest, Dr. Fouad Abdel Khaliq. Thank you again, Fouad, for your participation in this uh, episode, and thank you for sharing your various and rich expertise and experiences. All the luck and success for your future academic and professional activities. Thank you again and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.